So we've just seen episode four <clears throat> and seven of this series called The Comeback. We encourage you to go watch the, the other five episodes. Uh, they're free online. Um, we chose these particular episodes because we thought the content and some of the rhetoric would provide uh, productive conversation. And thankfully, we have four great panelists to guide us through that. Uh, so uh, first, uh, on your left here is Dr. Winnie Fong. She's a professor in the economics and business department. She's an economist. Uh, next to her is Dr. Paul Lee, who's a management professor in the business and economics department. Dr. Theon Hill, who's a professor in the communication department. And finally, Dr. Larissa Hawkins, who's a professor in political science. So I'm going to start them off with a question while you come up with your own questions. There's a microphone here. So after I get, get us started, feel free to come down. We'll have a time for your questions. Uh, one of the big points uh, or emphasis of these videos is the role of, of social entrepreneurship. And we've got this idea of community-driven social entrepreneurship as a primary driver of transformation. So I want to open up the panel and, and ask if they could comment on the role of social entrepreneurship, the role of the community, and the ways it's most effective, and maybe some of the limitations and challenges in transformation. And I'll open up this question to any of our panelists. I can address this question a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure how, how much our audience is aware of what social entrepreneurship is. So uh, let me just briefly explain what it is. Uh, social entrepreneurship combines the uh, uh, business principles uh, and business practices, rationalized business practices, with the uh, social objective of nonprofit industry. So the idea is that uh, you know nonprofit industry does good things, but it's not self-sustaining. It always depends. Uh, it uh, is dependent on uh, the goodwill of others. Uh, whereas uh, business organizations, it is self-sustaining. It is growing but it is not, not necessarily doing good things in society in a very intentional way. Uh, it, is good, it is doing some good things through creating jobs and uh, um, growing the economy, but uh, not in a very intentional way. So social enterprise is trying to bring the best of these two words and combining them in one organization. Um, why is social enterprise is uh, useful in a, a context like uh, we've seen in, this, uh, in these communities? Uh, a lot of times, uh, uh, businesses, the purpose of businesses, uh, most businesses, uh, to generate and maximize profit. And some of these uh, communities, uh, there is not that much uh, of a great opportunity to uh, generate uh, and substantial profit. So uh, most businesses do not choose to uh, go into these areas. So a lot of these areas are, uh, in terms of business, is desert. There are no businesses, really viable business. There are no job opportunities in these communities. Um, and we think of businesses as an uh, institution that goes into community and often extracts resources out of community. And some cases, that is true. But social enterprises actually operate in a very different manner. So instead of going to a community and trying to extract resources, social enterprises go there with a, uh, a very explicit purpose to uh, replenish some of the resources that these communities lack. So uh, they go there uh, for the purpose of creating jobs. Uh, sometimes uh, they go there to uh, sometimes create a community. Uh, uh, businesses, uh, in essence, uh, really is a nexus of relationships. Business is, uh, is a place where people would need come to buy things. Also, uh, people with uh, need for jobs go get jobs. And people with capital go uh, to uh, increase capital. In a way, it's a place of community. Uh, and a lot of good businesses are places of community. They connect with communities, and they, uh, um, uh, and they generate a lot of goodwill in the community. Uh, and social businesses want to be that kind of businesses. And, uh, a lot of the businesses that are created here are, are created for that purpose. So it is going into the communities, creating jobs, creating communities, and building that social capital that uh, these communities lack. I, I would respond um, by pushing back on a few things. Um, in both films, a lot of what is portrayed as social entrepreneurship is in fact public-private partnerships um, and or a mix of both government, uh, of government, private, and um, 
kind of civil societal uh, resources. So the faith-based and community initiative, which was highlighted in one of the films, is not the same as social entrepreneurship. Um, another problem is we could take out the, the word entrepreneurship in some cases and say, well, what's different from social entrepreneurship and social experimentation um, in neighborhoods and communities? And often a problem with social entrepreneurship is um, where is the social entrepreneurship bubbling up from? Is it coming from the grassroots? Is it coming from outside? Um, are communities consulted? Is it replicative of things that are extant in the community? And does it, rather than um, spur um, kind of local ingenuity, um, actually uh, deter it or in some senses um, snuff it out, right? And so while we see positive examples in the video, obviously, um, we don't see some of the flip sides of potential problems of social entrepreneurship and related to faith-based organizations because both of these were churches, right? The question then becomes, what's the difference between um, ministries and social entrepreneurship? And so I think the big problem with the faith-based initiative isn't a question of, um, is Pharaoh, the government, giving churches money, compromising the prophetic voice? And that's a key question to ask. We could ask the same about social entrepreneurship these relationships between private industry and churches. And the values and the language of capitalism that you hear throughout those films, I would also say, is evidence of something that I would call um, a slippery slope, for lack of a better word, um, at this point. So I see social entrepreneurship as really trying to expand individuals' opportunity sets and trying to relax the constraints that they face. And this is something that we don't actually see a lot of emphasis in the two clips. So if you, was, if you were watching the two clips, it talks a lot about individual responsibility. Say for the first clip, it talks about the men's boot camp. You need to learn to be a responsible dad, a responsible husband, a responsible en employee, a responsible citizen. And then in the second clip, it also talks about um, how there's a role people must play in there own uplift. And I think it's very important to focus on um, individual responsibility in the fight for poverty, uh, fight against poverty. But it's also important to realize that individuals make decisions within certain uh, constraints. And we think about them as external constraints or external opportunity sets. So I think a more balanced view would be um, thinking about how we can encourage individual responsible decision making, but at the same time also um, help them and make those decisions by uh, increasing the opportunity sets and relaxing the constraints. And I, and I think um, social entrepreneurship helps to do that. And we could, we could talk more about those external constraints. So I'm thinking about, say, um, constraints like access to uh, job opportunities. Um, a lot of the, uh, when people think about the poor uh, in the US, sometimes they would say, well, the poor are on welfare because they, don't, they are lazy, they don't want to work. Mm -hmm. Um, so we shouldn't give welfare to them because uh, they, they, they simply would not go to work. But when you talk with uh, the poor, um, oftentimes they really want to work, but they simply do not have access to job opportunities. So it's not that they are irresponsible, not that they are lazy, but it's just that they are faced with this um, external constraint. Um, a second type of constraint would be access to education. If they are living in a zip code where there's simply no good public school system, no good um, quality education, this is going to affect the human capital accumulation, affect the skill sets they get, and which in turn will affect the kind of um, uh, labor market that they could get into. Um, then a third type of constraints would be access to credit. They talked about um, debt free, um, but uh, uh, oftentimes, uh, the poor may not have a good savings um, or credit uh, line that they could actually be able to get credit or get um, loans from a bank. So they may have to resort to payday loans or resort to loan sharks. So it's not as if they do not know that they shouldn't go to a loan shark, but they may simply do not have assets to um, a lower interest rate uh, type of loans that um, the majority of us might have the privilege to have access to. So I think um, emphasizing both the external constraints and individual responsibility is very important. Great, thank you. So I think we've touched on a, a, this a little bit, but um, what are some of the misconceptions about poverty that, um, that the church may have or the so our society might have? And uh, how might these episodes either, either play into that or reshape our perceptions of poverty? 
I would say particularly in the 80s, there was a big push to the fact that if someone wanted a job in America, that there was a job available for them. And so what you hear in a lot of churches and in a lot of uh, evangelical circles is that if someone doesn't have a job, if someone's poor, it's their fault. They're lazy, they're a welfare queen, they're this or they're that. And I think what these episodes um, accomplish is in some ways they reinforce these stereotypes. Because if you listen in particular with the first video, the problem is primarily internal. And so when you think about the internal issues, what you need is an internal transformation. And then what the pastor says is, then you go to work. That assumes that there's a job out there for you. That assumes that that job is paying well enough for you to support any family that you have. That assumes a lot of things that may not be true. So in, this, in many ways, the videos reinforce the idea that it's a land of opportunity for those who are willing to take advantage of the opportunities. I would also even go beyond um, what Dr. Fung said about um, these kinds of external or extrinsic factors and talk about the actual economic opportunity structure for the men that were portrayed in this film. So if the option is between working at a corner store, um, selling drugs, or casting your hope in playing professional football or baseball, right? <laughs> this is a reality for many people in Chicago. Um, then actually, all of a sudden, when you hurt your knee in high school, um, or you go to college, but you go to a D2 or a D3, and your likelihood of making it to the NFL combine are slim to none, right? All of a sudden, selling drugs is part of a rational calculus, actually. And so I think that is a kind of structural reality that we have to acknowledge, right? Um, given those other structural factors that she mentioned. Um, in addition to, to those factors, I think it's important relative to misconceptions about poverty, which um, uh, Dr. Cook alluded to in the introduction. Um, we can't discuss poverty without discussing inequality in the United States. And so we have to get out on the table the fact of vast income inequality in the US whereby the top 5% of income earners by most projections own about 90% of the wealth in the country. So that's one thing. So we don't have um, poverty, we don't have, let's say welfare as well is important because that's the other, other elephant in the room. When we talk about poverty, mm -hmm. we're almost always talking about welfare policy. And the film sets up this dichotomy between market solutions and government solutions. Mm -hmm. So we also have to address that elephant in the room because when we talk about poverty, we're talking about judgments about the poor who are perceived by Americans vastly to be black and lazy. Not just lazy, black and lazy. So we have to put out the fact that this is a racialized video, both of them, and the white people you saw in both of them, Paul Ryan, um, and if you don't know who that is, Google it on your phone right now, um, you should know. And then in addition to that, um, I think it's very important to um, understand that when we talk about welfare, we're not talking about food stamps. We're talking about what's called TANF. Many people who are not below the poverty line, the government's figure to calculate whether you're poor for the purpose of government programs, um, people above the poverty line, professors at Wheaton College are eligible for food stamps, y'all. So when we talk about food stamps, we're sometimes talking about the working poor, people who are working, or even um, middle class people. So, um, and this is based on family size and some other things. Um, so when we talk about poverty, we also are almost always talking about race. We're talking about welfare. And most Americans believe that the majority of people, over 50% of people on welfare are black, when in fact people on TANF, temporary assistance to needy, needy families, 32% white, 31% black, 30% Hispanic. Mm. Now there's a higher rate of poverty in the black community, but those on TANF equal percentages. So it's important to know that misconceptions are predicated on this idea that people on welfare are black and lazy. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about poverty, mm. a racialized issue, which the film portrays, actually. And I think another misconception about poverty that we have is often defining poverty or the poor in terms of material poverty. So we think of the poor as those who live below a certain wage level or the poor as not being able to afford certain things. But when you ask the poor themselves, and this is done by a World Bank study uh, looking at voices of the poor, um, the poor don't define themselves in this way. They define themselves as 
Um, I'm poor because I simply do not have hope. I'm living in constant despair. I'm living in constant fear. Um, in the first clip, they talk about this phrase, paralyzed by fear. Um, and they talked about help, healing, and hope. And I think the, the, the hope part, um, the fear part, the insecurity part, it's m more a definition of those who are living in poverty than the actual material well-being. Um, I remember Dr. Koch, um, in, like, when we were talking about poverty earlier on, not, not today, uh, he mentions that when we were grad students, I guess all of us here, we used to be grad students, um, we live way below the poverty line. But none of us uh, see ourselves as being poor, none of us see ourselves as being really desperate or being paralyzed by fear, because even though we live way below the poverty line, we live on ramen, noodles, like, you know, being in grad school. Um, like, it's, it's very different. So I think it's very important for us to think about the poor as not those simply who are materially poor, but those because of um, their upbringing, the family circumstances they face, the community environment that they face, that they simply do not have any kind of aspirations. There's this um, phrase in the first clip saying that they don't know what redemption looks like. Um, even when you talk about hope or aspirations, redemption, restoration, um, they, they do not have anyone modeling that for them. Um, so I see that access to role models as a fourth external constraint. Like, um, Growing up in a poor neighborhood, poor household, where all my peers are involved in drugs, involved in crime, none of my peers finish high school. So even if I know that I could do better, I, I, no one has ever taught me that I could do better. Mm -hmm. So I, I see that more as defining um, some of the problems that the poor face. Can I push back? Yeah. Sorry, I teach a whole class on this. If I seem really intense, that's why. Um, the The additional thing I would add about poverty is the myth of the culture of poverty which was also displayed prominently in the film, the idea that the poor lack values, that black men aren't good dads, and in fact, a study by the Centers for Disease Control shows that black fathers, the absent black father is a myth, that black fathers spend as much time with their children as white fathers and Latino fathers who are not married to their partners. Um, and in addition to that, this idea that black poor people have no role models, I find in my research untrue. Um, that the poor often have their own role models, and that the idea of role models is often predicated on a notion of the middle class as the model, as opposed to the poor having their own role models, both in the working class and in poor communities. Mm. So, Another quick, mis I mean, if I may quick interject here, uh, another misconception, I think, uh, in that was portrayed in the video was uh, there was a, seemed to be, I mean, probably it was unintentional, but there was a, a strong association between um, poverty and crime and drugs, uh, which is not true at all. Uh, uh, I grew up in a very, very poor neighborhood. Uh, and um, uh, yes, in my neighborhood, uh, crime rate maybe was higher than the rest of the city. Uh, maybe drug use was maybe a little higher than the rest of the city, but uh, we had, it was not uh, a community just ridden with crimes and uh, drug use. In fact, we had a very vibrant community. In fact, actually, when I uh, uh, invite my uh, friends from church to come to, our, come to my house, they, they were actually sometimes hesitant to come and uh, visit, uh, visit our family because uh, they, uh, thought we live in a very dangerous community. I think actually this, uh, this association with uh, poverty, with crime and drug, I think it um, creates, that, uh, uh, f uh, creates that fear in some people's mind that I mean, we should uh, stay away from those communities. Uh, and I think it exacerbates the situation of poverty in those communities. So I think it's important for us to I mean, distinguish that. I mean, it's not, I mean, there is higher rate, but I mean, it's, uh, that's not, uh, the prevalent thing. There is a lot of uh, good things uh, in that community. Great. <clears throat> uh, sort of related to that and our perceptions of poverty, um, Daryl in the first video mentioned that we're not going to hold someone hostage in offering them redemption. I want to ask the panel, in what ways do we as society or as a church tend to hold people hostage or expect something in return? for these redemption opportunities. I 
can totally answer, but I've been talking a lot. <laughs> Want me to go? Go for it. Um, basically, within um, government programs and even church programs, often um, there's some anthropological work that shows a strong emphasis on accountability especially where evangelicals and fundamentalists do these kinds of faith-based transformative programs. So the emphasis on accountability itself is not inherently wrong, right? Um, but the overemphasis on accountability actually isn't instilling um, the kind of personal responsibility that's supposedly at the heart of a lot of these programs, right? It's a kind of, um, it's a kind of punitive approach, actually. Um, to uh, reformation and what they called restoration, um, reintegrating people back into society if we're talking about the people in the video, for example. So in fact, um, a, an emphasis on accountability isn't inherently wrong because if you're getting government money, you're accountable for how you spend the money. You actually can't spend the money um, for drug rehab programs on um, printing out you know, Bible tracts or buying Bibles. You have to spend it only on the drug rehab program. Um, you can't even spend it on buildings, right? So there's a level of accountability that we all agree is necessary and important, but what it looks like to hold individuals accountable for certain values, again, that we decide are the appropriate values that they should embody um, and reflect is is questionable. It, it's a punitive approach. And that doesn't mean that programs shouldn't have standards, right, um, that people have to meet in terms of coming to a certain number of meetings to stay in the program, those kinds of things. But the kinds of accountability we're talking about are the kinds that say um, you have to um, look like someone from an upper middle class white community as opposed to someone who grew up um, on the west side of Chicago. So kind of cultural accountability as well. What I found really fascinating in the video was that uh, what the uh, ministries, uh, the churches are doing is uh, really uh, rebuilding community. Uh, some of you who uh, studied uh, anthropology and sociology uh, may have heard the term community, uh, I mean social capital, community capital or social capital. Social capital basically means that uh, community and relationships can become important resources for uh, flourishing of life, right? And, uh, these uh, ministries, uh, um, they are creating, uh, just bringing these uh, men or the people together to uh, build a better uh, relationship of uh, mutual reciprocity and also uh, mutual assistance and also building a, a, a very trusting environment. And that it, itself can become resources of creating uh, greater, resor uh, greater uh, goods in the community. Uh, for building community, and also when somebody is uh, uh, when somebody is uh, in uh, desperate need, you have now you now have uh, more people to go uh, and um, rely on and uh, and uh, build uh, build a uh, uh, community together. And in fact, actually, there are uh, researches in criminology that says I mean when you have uh, communities where neighbors know each other better, the crime rate is uh, the crime rate goes down. So uh, I thought uh, what they were doing was uh, very, very impressive. Question? Yeah, Can I, I, was, I was just about to open the floor. So <laughs> come on down. So uh, speak in the microphone, state your name, and then your question. Okay, Dylan Andrus, I'm a business economics major. Something that I found interesting in the video was the reference in the first video that the neighborhood under question used to be a prominent neighborhood. Uh, I'm from St. Louis, and something that characterizes the history of St. Louis and maybe some other things, for lack of a better term, is what's called the, the white flight. And my question really is, can you talk about how a community falls into that cycle of poverty and, and kind of what roles businesses play into it, whether it be leaving the community and what roles kind of government plays into it, whether it be municipal or local governments and kind of how a community goes from being a prominent neighborhood to one that we see in the video. There's a lot of factors. I'll just give a couple, and I'll let my colleagues fill in where I uh, lack. Um, but one of the things that you see, especially during the 60s, integration fueled a lot of white flight. So the fact that we have to live near people we don't like, we need to leave the neighborhood. If you go to certain communities, uh, 
in Chicago, I'm thinking of on the south side, certain elements of the south side are still segregated. Um, but one of the things that fuels white flight, you know, you have the um, citizens leave, then you have a lot of the uh, social structure leave, whether it's churches, businesses, and so you have a lot of people left without the economic means of starting new businesses or even advancing the community, and so that really leaves to, leads to a lot of things. And then during the 70s, you have a lot of the jobs and companies leaving the communities, and what does that cycle through? It causes a lot of the schools. Now we have no funding for schools, and so we have educational outcomes. Now we have people stuck there without educational opportunities to get out of there, and then we have social decay in terms of economic opportunities for people in various communities. One, and, one, yeah. and one of the problems when the businesses leave, businesses, especially industry, if you take the train from here up to Chicago, right, you used to be able to see the old Brock's candy factory. Um, this side of town, there used to be the old Zenith TV factory. Mm -hmm. And as these businesses leave and relocate to Wheaton, Lyle, um, this area, and now they're going back to the city, but not that part of the city, not East Garfield Park. Um, what you also lose is a tax base for education, and that's huge. And there goes the neighborhood, and there goes um, whites, and incomes um, often, because the houses become affordable, um, racial and ethnic minorities, because they might be able to afford the houses, and they might be able to leave areas that were previously redlined, meaning off limits to them. So it's a vicious cycle. Um, and Chicago is perhaps the most racially segregated city um, by most counts in the country in that regard. So. And this is also an area in terms of the tax dollars in particular where mass incarceration becomes a major issue. Because as soon as you have the mass incarceration of black and brown men, okay, where are those tax dollars going? They're not going to the communities where they have residency. They're going to the jail communities where they're in. So if you go down to Illinois, you have a large number of tax dollars coming as a result of incarceration. So it creates a cycle of, I mean, in terms of communities having no tax base through which to have improvements. Yeah. And it's interesting. There's an economist named Thomas Schelling did a very, very interesting study using uh, computer simulations. Um, you know, they say uh, birds of, feather, uh, birds of uh, f feather flock together, right? <laughs> um, the, his idea was that, you know, maybe there are some people who are uh, uh, starting um, and moving into communities, different communities, because, let's say, they don't like a different group of people, right? But uh, he's arguing that in, actually in a simulation uh, that proved that uh, Majority of people actually are not like that. Majority of people don't move to certain communities because they don't like certain group of people. They go move to certain communities because they simply like uh, people who are who look like them. Uh, and so, uh, uh, when maybe the first movers are the people who are um, who have uh, not a very good motivation, but a vast majority of people actually uh, move into communities uh, because uh, they simply like. People who are like them, they simply like a uh, good uh, school district. So in order uh, for us to break this uh, chain of, uh, I mean, segregation and reintegrate, and there are, there we need people who intentionally move into uh, different communities. And that's what one of our uh, uh, alumni, <laughs> uh, Wayne Gordon, has been uh, emphasizing again and again. We have to relocate and reintegrate our communities, and that takes intentional effort. And governments, local governments, can also subsidize, um, trying to provide incentives for people to relocate and to deal with the property tax issue, um, subsidizing some housing and public school um, in zip codes with lower socioeconomic status as a way to encourage um, uh, more development there. So while you come up with more, of qu more questions, I have a question. Um, throughout these two episodes, we've been talking about community. And there's, there's somewhat of a prescribed uh, vision for mobility and upward mobility in community. And it's also mentioned in the last episode, Dr. Martin Luther King's idea of the beloved community. I was wondering if you could comment on community, on the prescription of community uh, providing this upward mobility and how it compares to uh, Dr. King's vision. Sure, I'll take that one. <laughs> Uh, this was probably the area where I started ripping my hair out as I watched the videos. Um, 
Dr. King's vision of the beloved community was based on a vision of social transformation. Um, it's really rooted in his first book, uh, Strength to Love, which was a collection of his sermons. Um, and I actually wrote this down before I came today just to make sure I didn't quote him wrong. Um, he argued that truth is not to be found either in traditional capitalism or in Marxism. Each represents a partial truth. Historically, capitalism failed to discern the truth of collective enterprise, and Marxism failed to see the truth in individual enterprise. These videos ground his notion entirely in the realm of individual upward mobility or individual enter enterprise, which I suspect he would reject. Um, especially if you look at a lot of his later rhetoric, this is very counter King um, for some of his uh, views on upward mobility in society and what it would take for that to become a reality. He would argue instead that the notion of the beloved community is a place where freedom and equality reign supreme. Um, and this can only be realized by a partnership between, sure, individual responsibility, but also structural transformation. There's a heavy emphasis on the, in these videos on freedom, freedom, freedom. There's not as much talk about equality. So you can be free, but if you have no opportunity, you're not quite equal. You can be free, but if you don't have educational opportunities, you don't have equal opportunity. So it's impossible to talk about freedom as our end goal without pairing equality with it. Another part of Dr. King's beloved community was a poor people's campaign, which mm -hmm. occupied, I mean, his last speech before he died um, was at a sanitation strike. So he was emphasizing economic opportunity, um, not just um, kind of equality for, for black Americans and all Americans, but economic equality as well. Meaning um, freedom is not freedom without security. Meaning if you have no food, you're not really truly free to go to school and learn. We know this, right? from actual studies that both economists and um, epidemiologists and um, other health experts do. Um, so again, the link between child nutrition and education is pretty clear. And so part of freedom is basic security. So liberty is a farce if there's no actual basic level of security in your person. And that's what welfare is about. It's about well-being. It is about physical well-being and material well-being. It's not the only thing, right? Spiritual well-being, as Dr. Fung said, but material well-being is fundamental to that. So. Yeah, and I see community. Oh, sorry, uh, as being really important to um, tackle the intergenerational stickiness of poverty. Um, poverty is never just an individual thing. Like there's so much intergenerational stickiness. Um, uh, I see it as a kind of intergenerational um, evil as well. Um, so uh, in order to tackle this kind of intergenerational evil, you really need um, not just transformation within an individual's lifetime, but transformation within generations and generations of time. Hi. Um, so I don't have an exact question, but just kind of a topic that um, came up to me was that people in the book or in the films were um, black, but they were also male, um, and only women really came up when they brought their sons to the events. Um, and so I, I know like not only men are poor, um, so if you could just talk about some of like how it could be problematic to shape, frame it as only men being the problem or like only men being the solution or only black men. It seems to connect to like um, Black Lives Matter, things like that. So. Great question. I thought men were the problem. <laughs> no, no, don't let me answer that. Well, no, I mean, uh, oh, sorry. go ahead, please. Um, really, uh, in, a, in a very poor communities, uh, um, you know, uh, it's a whole family suffers. Uh, I remember actually uh, uh, many years ago, uh, our church took uh, like a small uh, group mission team uh, to an uh, inner uh, city neighborhood in uh, Washington, D.C. It was a Christmas time, so uh, uh, we wanted to actually hold a Christmas party for the neighborhood kids. So we wanted to go invite all the uh, kids from the neighborhood to hold a big Christmas party. Um, so. Uh, the, uh, the day before Christmas, and Christmas Eve in the uh, daytime, we'd actually go and knock on uh, uh, 
like each house and uh, try to uh, extend invitation. And most of these houses, most of these houses, there were no adults. The only kids, sometimes uh, five-year-old, seven-year-old were home alone. Uh, so we would ask actually, where, where is your mom, where is your dad? He says, well, they went to work. Because on Christmas Eve, nobody else works, so my parents have to go work, right? Um, so the poverty, uh, I mean, you know, uh, and, uh, when uh, Lyndon Johnson talked about uh, this, uh, uh, like, declared war on poverty, he, uh, his, team, his team of economists and sociologists actually defined something called poverty cycle. So you have this poverty, and poverty uh, gives birth to this environment of, uh, that lacks motivation, that saps motivation. And if you don't have motivation, then you, have, uh, you don't have enough education, and you are physically uh, not well. And then that uh, saps your opportunity for uh, uh, improving economically yourself economically. And then that leads to poverty. So it, it's just constant cycle. And I saw, I saw that when I was in uh, Washington, D.C. that uh, winter. Um, uh, I mean, the kids have no parents to take, uh, no, they had no parents who could take care of them. Uh, and uh, parents had to work uh, two jobs, three jobs, uh, both parents, uh, just to sustain living. And then, uh, uh, I mean, like uh, Dr. Hawkins had mentioned earlier, uh, that, I mean, that uh, the, the, because there are no businesses, uh, uh, the city lacks uh, tax revenue and so cannot support the uh, good schools, uh, good infrastructure, and it just goes on and on and on. Uh. Well, I was just going to say, in terms of the gendered aspect of welfare, it's uh, the, the classic image of welfare is the black welfare queen. Um, not men. So this is a curi these both of these videos are curious, um, and I think the unspoken assumption or elephant in the room is that these are um, prison to work programs. And so um, what I think this film does in a strange way is, um, and with the metaphor of men's boot camp, is actually reify the notion of black men as part of what um, Dr. Michael Leo Owens calls a carceral republic, and that black men are never free. In fact, even when they're free, they're put back into a system that treats them as animals. That's what I saw. And what I saw was a denuding of the dignity of black men in that film. Um, because the unspoken assumption is that they are all caught up in the system. And yes, they were being transformed, and there were some beautiful stories of transformation, of capitalism and entrepreneurship, and how it's wedded to the gospel, but it was a reification of stereotypes of black men, period. That's what I saw. Yeah, so I think it's important not just to emphasize both men and women, but also the white poor in the US. Um, the white poor are often very invisible population that people don't talk about, mm -hmm. people don't care about. Yeah, the focus on urban poverty alone, right? Mm. You know, that's quite problematic given the prevalence of poverty on um, reservations in the United States. The highest rate of poverty is on a reservation in the United States and in uh, rural areas, not just Appalachia. Rural areas in this state and probably in the state that you come from. Yeah. So, Even suburban poverty is mm -hmm. increasing. Uh, yep, yeah. in this county. And I'll just say this briefly, if you look at how black men are portrayed in these videos, um, it feeds directly or it draws directly from the logics that supported slavery as the black man, as the sexual predator who was lazy, who was not a good worker. I mean, these are the same logics that we continue to wrestle with. It's not a thing of the past, but it endures to the present, even though we don't recognize it as such. Hi, I'm Tyler Garrett. Uh, my question is, we talked about the constraints, the constraints of education, constraints of access to jobs, access to capital. Um, I was wondering how can either government policies or civil society actors, whether it be businesses, churches, or individuals, how can we act to remove those constraints or limit them? And maybe which ones are more important that you guys see as the principal ones to attack first, and then which actors may be better suited to fix which constraints? So 
such a tough question. Um, so there are so many different uh, external constraints, and it f I think their importance uh, varies from context to context, varies from communities to communities. Um, but definitely, we want to have um, a multi-pronged approach to uh, relaxing those constraints. So say, um, access to education, um, both civil society and government can play a role in that. Um, can, so from the government's point of view, can they um, provide incentives for high quality teachers to be willing to stay in poor neighborhoods, um, uh, less resourced public schools to be, to be willing to stay there and work and, and teach? Um, and, um, for, say, NGOs and faith-based organizations, are they willing to provide, say, after-school tutoring services, mentoring programs to help um, provide educational opportunities, job skills training uh, for, for people who need it? Um, access to credit, um, like legislature, uh, we, we could have the government um, like pass legislature to crack down on loan sharks, payday loans. And I, I know some churches who actually put money together to help um, individuals in the communities to, to actually pay back payday loans. Um, so there are a lot of creative ways to, to deal with these uh, external constraints. Mm. Yeah, sort of like the, uh, uh, in the video numbers, uh, the, the second video that we, watched, uh, um, forget the name of the, uh, uh, the speaker, but uh, he mentioned that, I mean, it has to be a partnership uh, between government, community, church, and businesses. Um, uh, for <laughs> for uh, um, an enemy like this, uh, uh, we need all the, uh, all the firepower we can get, I think, to, uh, to combat this. Uh, so we want to, uh, I mean, we want to work together, I think. Uh, uh, social enterprises, nonprofit organizations, and each, uh, each of these uh, organization sectors have different uh, specialty, right? And we need to bring these expertise together to make it work. And we saw some, I think, a little bit of the example in the second video, a little bit there. I also think, um, is it Tyler? A lot of us have a tendency to um, prioritize or catapult one over the other. Mm -hmm. And I think true partnership really does mean um, taking the best of the private sphere, putting that in the public sphere. And there are a lot of movements to do that within government. Um, I think to give a, a theological answer that I really believe, I think that um, policymakers would do well to not demonize populations, um, socially construct them in ways that say they're not deserving. So one thing that we see in welfare policy is a construction of people as undeserving. So the elderly are deserving, so they get three times as many benefits as the young poor, including children. Um, and most of it's cash and very flexible. So my grandmother gets a deposit in her bank account every month from the federal government, whereas young poor people who need to buy school supplies and clothes for their children, they get very inflexible benefits. Um, and they're, again, three times less than what the elderly get, um, who get other kinds of benefits in addition to social security. And so those ways that we frame those individuals affect policy. Um, but I would also say in, in um, to laud private industry, not just social entrepreneurship, companies, not just out of a sense of public relations like ConAgra um, are, and others are seeking to fight childhood poverty, for example. So I also think we need to applaud the, the private sphere when they're doing these kinds of things and not only assume the kind of worse um, or kind of like intentions, again, to kind of get more customers, whatever, um, but to actually applaud them and support them in ways that we can. So. When we think in terms of uh, two areas in particular, when we think of education, uh, my colleagues already talked about some things in terms of promoting uh, solid teachers, but we also need to reimagine what we're teaching in particular communities that may not have the financial basis of some communities. If you go to the city of Aurora where I live, you'll find a planetarium at the school. I promise you, if you go to Julian High School in the city, you will not find a planetarium. Um, the 70s witnessed the decline of art programs in schools and a lot of the humanities. I mean, rap music, particularly in New York, really emerged because of the decline of art programs in schools. So even educational opportunities in terms of curriculum needs to be rethought uh, in terms of what a government uh, funding could do. Um, uh, various things like that. When we also think about the criminal justice system, think of how we sentence softcore drugs. Uh, that's a matter that's come up for a lot of debate, but 
you have before the 80s, you know, marijuana use was not a felony. It was a misdemeanor. I mean, why is crack cocaine getting a lot lengthier sentences than pure cocaine? I mean, these are questions that really condemn people to um, a lifetime of being uh, treated as a second class citizen. When you get out of jail, you're never going to be able to get a job, which is going to really limit your career opportunities. And one more thing to add is that every time we think about these kind of policies, whether from the government perspectives or programs from civil society's perspective, it's very important to involve the poor and bring them to the table when we design those policies and when we ask the poor, like, what constraints are you facing? What kind of opportunities you want to be to to have have more? I think oftentimes we feel that we are in a privileged position to, to define for the poor what they need, and then we implement the policy without even asking whether that's what they, what they need. Okay. Um, Andrew Lankford. Um, so just with this whole, um, this whole topic, how much should we treat um, the racial issues together with the more economic issues? Like, obviously they are connected, but like, can we separate them? If so, to what extent, or should we not? I don't think we really can separate race and class. That's a lot of people try to talk about them as different, but they really do influence and inform one another. If you look at the genesis of many of the economic and racial issues, especially in the reconstruction era of the nation, they went hand in hand in terms of how we try to disempower certain people groups. I mean, you think of things like separate but equal, you think of the Jim Crow laws, even the black codes coming before that. So when you talk about economic empowerment, you have to situate it within the racial context of our nation, which it, which it emerged. There was a lot of talk in these videos about uh, the free market. Within an American context, that's always been somewhat of a farce. America's always had a source of exploited labor. And that's always, that source of exploited labor has always been someone of non-European descent whether it's um, African Americans, whether it's uh, Hispanic Americans, or immigrants, or even uh, Asian labor at the end of the uh, 19th century. And so you can't talk about one without discussing the other. I'll add to that too. If we look at different laws and different traditions, uh, we don't, don't only see a discrepancy in income, but we see a huge discrepancy in assets. And that's such a vital, uh, plays such a vital role in terms of intergenerational wealth. So we've seen this huge dis discrepancy in assets between different races. That's yeah. really it empowers uh, one race and to pass on wealth to their children and disempowers the other. Which is also just not just wealth and not just like inequality, but mobility. Like the ability, like the American dream is that you're going to do better than your parents, right? And so it's, it's not just the fact of assets or income. Like black unemployment has been double white unemployment forever. Right. Yes. <laughs> forever. I mean, since we were able to enter the labor market. Um, and it is still today. And this idea of um, inequality is exacerbated by a lack of mobility. And you can look at names and see which Dr. Long has done in our own econ department mm -hmm. and see some of that correspondence between the two. So European names versus others. So. Mm -hmm. Although I guess I have a European name, so whatever. But. Yeah, a lot of us do. <laughs> Different discussion. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience before I finish up with a couple? I wanted to ask the panel, while you think of the last question, what policies do you think have worked really well? And we've talked a lot about policies that haven't been as productive as, we, as, we, as we've hoped, but what policies do you think have been productive and have helped the most? And I'll expand that, not just policies, but programs. So either at the, the government level or at the yeah. private or, or community level. I would say two, um, and not in their totality, parts of each of them. Um, the community development block grants in the United States, um, which emerged out of um, the war on poverty and were continued by the Nixon administration, although tweaked by the Nixon administration. But community development block grants have certainly provided money to communities of certain sizes 
to emphasize programs, including things like Head Start or programs for the elderly, um, sometimes to shore up infrastructure in communities, which improve the well-being of people in communities. So this sounds kind of boring, but sewer systems are really expensive. And so, um, so one of the community development block grants provides money to shore up sewage systems in cities. Um, but that's really important, not just to personal well-being and the ability to flush the toilet and not use outhouses, but also to health. Um, so those things are big deals. Um, community development block grants, sexy topic of government. Um, another one um, that I would add is really intriguing beyond the community development block grant. Now I'm going to be like um, Rick Perry and forget the other very important program. Um, I'll, come, I'll come back to it. I will. I will remember eventually CDBG. Okay, go on, someone else. <laughs> I said one, I've done my job. Uh, I can suggest one. So I, I strongly believe there's no silver bullet. So if, I mean, there really is no silver bullet. Um, but if I'm asked to um, like give one example, I would say focus on early childhood intervention programs. Um, recent research has shown that intervention has the biggest bang for the buck if it happens really early in childhood. So it's pretty late in the game when we start to have programs or policies that help, say, teenagers or help adults, uh, when the inequality gap in terms of human capital accumulation, in terms of cognitive development already started like when they were born. Um, so focusing on maternal health, infant health, focusing on parental resources, investments uh, in taking care of their kids um, when they were in the age range of zero to three years old, mm -hmm. um, I think has a huge bang for the buck. Um, and this would include providing resources for um, working parents who simply may not um, be able to spend time with their kids. So um, Dr. Lee just mentioned um, like knocking on like household stores and like finding a five-year-old at home, it's been shown that um, kids in poor families, poor households simply do not get access to words spoken to them when they are young. Um, but then if you are exposed to more words spoken to you um, when you were, say, zero to one years old or zero to three years old, it actually changes your brain cognitively and it's going to affect um, your later uh, cognitive, emotional, psychological development. Mm -hmm. um, so actually having programs that encourage um, these kinds of early live investment uh, is, 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 is important. Also Head Start, that wasn't the one that I was thinking of, but um, in addition to the early zero to three, um, Head Start also is not partisan. Um, my home state of Oklahoma, which is very red, no county voted for Obama in 2008 or 2012, um, has one of the most successful Head Start programs in the country and is seeing dramatic turnarounds in the Tulsa Public School District on the basis of investing in Head Start. And so it's not a partisan issue, it's not an ideological issue, it's about child well-being, which most of us agree with, and, and education improves our communities all around. So, I remember asking this question to uh, Wayne, Pastor Wayne Gordon in the uh, Lawndale community. Uh, he mentioned something like, I can't remember it exactly, but um, he mentioned something uh, about a, a government policy that was instituted not too long ago, about a couple of decades ago, um, that allows uh, corporations and community organizations in partnership uh, uh, to create a, a, a fund to reinvest into the community. So a lot of the buildings, uh, apartment buildings, and these uh, the new buildings that were, uh, he was able to uh, uh, build in uh, Lawndale community was in partnership with uh, different corporations. So uh, corporations will donate a certain amount of money uh, to uh, the uh, community uh, development organization, and uh, corporations will get a, a substantial tax credit for it. And then uh, uh, the community development organization will uh, invest the money into the community building hospitals, clinics, and uh, uh, subsidized housings. And so he, he said uh, that was a very, very effective program. I'll go to a private enterprise. Since the uh, 70s, I'd say late 70s, early 80s, a lot of black churches, um, particularly in urban communities, have an expanded vision for their role in community development. I'm thinking in particular in the Chicago area of churches like Trinity United Church of Christ or the Apostolic Church of God, where they're saying, we have a fairly large apparatus of um, financial capital. Why don't we use this to help develop a credit union or something like that to support um, various people's um, 
uh, ability to have upward mobility or to invest or things like that. I also look at places like the Apostolic Church of God, which I mentioned a second ago, which leverages a lot of its financial capital for scholarships for its students. So I think the black church since the uh, early 70s, I mean late 70s, early 80s, has an expanded vision on how it can impact its surrounding community. All right, just a couple more questions. We talked about how our perceptions and even perceptions in a video, videos like these, are uh, make things complicated. What, what does success look like in the short run regarding poverty in the United States? From policy perspective? From any perspective. <laughs> the dismantling of stereotypes that is the individual's fault. Yeah. And also, uh, like uh, Dr. Fung has mentioned earlier, you know, Poverty, a lot of it is actually also subjective. There is objective element to it, but a subjective element. For example, a graduate school uh, working, uh, I mean, uh, eating a ramen noodle every night, <laughs> is, does not necessarily see herself or himself as uh, poor. Uh, the reason is because uh, there is an aspiration that uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of the, uh, at this tunnel there is a light. <laughs> so uh, uh, I think actually. Uh, uh, um, change of mindset, I think, is also very, very important. Uh, not only from the uh, like a person's subjective who are, uh, who are living in these uh, communities, but also people from outside uh, looking in, that uh, we see uh, uh, instead of uh, uh, a stereotype, a typical stereotype, a dangerous person, or uh, uh, crime-ridden communities, or uh, um, uh, drug infested community, instead of having these uh, negative uh, stereotypes, I mean, see them as our brothers and sisters uh, who are also created in God's image. Uh, I think that change of mindset can uh, make a big difference. I think Christians need to be on the forefront of, forefront of dismantling the myth of the American dream. Um, and by that, I mean four things. Number one, everyone can participate equally and start over. It's not true. Number two, that everyone has a reasonable anticipation of success in the United States. Not true. Number three, success results from actions and traits under one's own control. Um, not true. And number four, success implies virtue. And you saw that in the video. Failure, by corollary, means that you're a huge sinner, right? And so the idea that you can always start over and that actually this idea that everyone has liberty and therefore can hope and dream, like really, but based on the things we've talked about, um, that's farcical too. And it actually is um, destructive even further of the psyche, if we wanna talk about the black male psyche or we talked a lot about Black Lives Matter in the last year, right? Um, that's quite destructive to a group that has an, experienced historical trauma and continues to be traumatized to the present. Um, and other groups as well, right? We could talk about all marginalized groups in ways that this does not apply to them in different ways. We could talk about non-able-bodied people, right? We could talk about sexual minorities. We could talk about a lot of vulnerable groups in the country and say, actually, they don't start at the same place as many of us here do, right? So we can sit in grad school and be aspirational because we're already in grad school. We're already entitled enough to get there. So I would say this idea of the American dream is quite destructive on multiple levels and in terms of how this plays into public policy in addition to the framing um, of people on welfare as undeserving primarily, um, those are the kinds of things that I think we need to transform in this conversation and in our public policy, but also in our churches, where we've really wedded the gospel to this idea of capitalism. I'll give them to you at the end, or I'll email them to anyone who wants them. So. Uh, I can talk about, um, so subjective speaking, a successful poverty alleviation policy that could be um, 
I mean, according to governmental definition, would be trying to lift people up, up from the poverty line. So reducing the percentage of individuals, households living below the poverty line. We call that the poverty headcount ratio. And really focusing on also the poorest of the poor, um, reducing the inequality gap. Um, so that's more objective, I guess, measures. Um, but for myself, I guess personally, uh, I would see a successful policy um, alleviation program or intervention as one where the non-poor stops seeing the poor as the other, um, but also recognizing the non-poor, like we ourselves are also poor, and, and helping both the poor and the non-poor see that we, we really basically share um, common humanity in terms of we are really broken people, uh, deeply in need of God's grace. Um, so, so that's how I define a successful policy. So my last question is, uh, one of the community leaders says that we can't truly understand the causes and solutions of poverty until we walk in the shoes of the poor. So my question for the panelists are, how can students here at Wheaton College walk in the shoes of, of the poor? I would say that our spiritual state is one of poverty. Scripture says that we come empty handed. Um, and I think that I'm not sure that we comprehend the centrality of our poverty to our faith. Um, Sermon on the Mount emphasizes um, the blessedness of the poor. And I think we gloss over that um, as though it doesn't apply to us, that it applies to some class of people, as opposed to it applies to what our spiritual condition should be to comprehend the life that is truly life, which is our life in Christ. And so I think that in order to comprehend the lives of the poor, the poor in this country who give a higher percentage of their income to philanthropy, to churches and other sources than any other economic group in this country, because they understand something about what it means to empathize with others and to suffer with and to walk in solidarity. So unless we comprehend our own poverty, our own spiritual poverty, we will never comprehend what it is um, to walk with the poor. Uh, I can only share from my own personal experience. I think walking with the poor looked very differently for different people. Um, but for me, um, uh, it would be trying to put myself in situations where I could actually um, be friends with. Uh, people from a different socioeconomic background than myself. When I first came to Wheaton, I attended a church uh, in the suburbs for the first two years, but then I realized, oh, I'm in the suburb like 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's not good for, for me. Um, so I actually um, started attending a, a church in Chinatown for the past three, four years. And it's really helpful for me to actually be able to um, like meet people, talk with people, be friends with people, and there they are. They may be um, like first generation immigrants who may not be able to speak English, but it helps me to um, really understand where they are from. And it helps me, I think for myself, it's easy for me to um, go into this um, situation where it's out of sight, out of mind, if I don't see myself or surround myself with um, people who are who might be different from me, it's easy for me to be in a very comfortable bubble. Um, so I've also been thankful that um, being at Wheaton allowed me to um, be involved with the hunger program. So I try to visit a hunger student every summer and to, to spend time in a developing country and just to be more rooted uh, and grounded in, 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 in these issues. Um, mm -hmm. And there are also some little, little things that I do. Um, before I visit my hunger student, I try to take cold water showers like one month before just as a way to show solidarity with my students um, because they don't get to enjoy hot water shower. I really dislike cold water shower. So it's a way for me to um, kind of train myself physically to, to understand, okay, these are, I mean, it's, it's such a small thing, like, um, but uh, to train myself to, to show solidarity. Mm. And I, <laughs> there are many things that you can do. Um, but I think um, trying to give very physical reminder to yourself um, that, uh, this is the kind of um, environment that the poor may be facing, may be living, and can I identify with this kind of environment, this kind of mindset, and I'm, I'm doing that. Yeah. I'm not sure you can actually truly put yourself in poor shoes. Um, you know, uh, I mean, as I mentioned, I grew up in a very poor neighborhood. Uh, 
The poor are poor because they have no other choice. Uh, for us to go into these communities and uh, choose to live a poor life, we we'll actually uh, still have a choice. We are choosing to experience these, uh, uh, these lifestyle. So I think it's still uh, different. Uh, I think what's I think most important is I think Dr. Uh, Hawkins has mentioned earlier is that uh, stance of humility in our heart. That trying to uh, instead of uh, seeing poor as the poor, uh, uh, seeing them as uh, just like us, they are also a person created in God's image. Their circumstances may be different, but uh, in humility, we try to understand and learn from them as much as we can. Um, yeah, I don't think we can fu fully put ourselves in their shoes, but uh, yeah. Last, uh, uh, last March, the richest member of Congress made the statement that America's poor are the envy of the world. And that's a pretty interesting statement, highly objectionable in many ways. That statement fails to see what the challenge of poverty really is. The challenge of poverty is not that I don't have as much money as you. The challenge of poverty is that I don't have any power. So when we think about poverty and what you all can be doing is when you consider the poor, they've been alienated. They don't have agency. They are, have limited opportunity. Even when it comes to empowerment, it's what someone else says is good for them. We rob them of their humanity. So as college students, what can we do? Remember that they're people made in the image of God. That comes through engagement. That comes through um, conversations. I'm not saying it in the sense that you can actually walk in their shoes, but go and talk to people who are different than you. Go and listen to them, not so that you can come in with a savior complex, but that you can learn from them. You can hear them talk, share their thoughts, share their way of life. I spent a gap year working uh, with uh, the poor in Indianapolis at a counseling center. And it was a wonderful year, but the best thing I learned was, wow, <laughs> these people have so much to teach me. And it really gave me a new sense for the humanity of people whom I hadn't had the opportunity like that to encounter in that way before. So as college students, I say, get outside of the classroom. Don't miss class, but get outside of the classroom. <laughs> and learn to hang out with people who are different than you. And you'll be surprised how much you have in common, but how much you can learn from people who are different than you. Great. Let's thank our panelists.